welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 10 for February the 5th, 2017. We begin a new unit today, Unit 3, entitled The Birthing of a New Community. And our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is All for One. Our devotional reading is uh, taken from Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 17. Our background scripture is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, and Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Our print passage today uh, comes out of Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 26 through 29, and then Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Our key verse reads, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's taken from Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 28, from the NIV translation. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to discover the unity of Christians based on the saving work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Second aim, to appreciate that through Christ we are all one in the church. And number three, is to examine ourselves for prejudiced attitudes against other believers. We have three outlines today that we will be discussing. The first one is entitled Reconciliation. Uh, the second outline is entitled Rectification. And the third outline is entitled Rationalization. I certainly thank and praise God for this great opportunity to be able to share this lesson uh, with you today, uh, one that I think that uh, is, is, is much needed in our churches today. And I'm so glad to be able to uh, prayerfully point us in a, in a direction where we can uh, be one, that we can unify, that we can work together and, and draw strength uh, from what Christ has done for all of us. I want to read a little bit of the biblical context that's associated with this uh, adult quarterly and then I want to read a little bit from uh, background from our lesson standard. Paul's letter to the Galatians is one of the most significant writings in the New Testament. The book deals strongly with our being justified by faith by accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior and following the Jewish laws, new converts were positioned to receive the full blessing and benefits of Israel's Messiah. Beginning in chapter 3, Paul would seek to develop his teaching on justification. He intended to do this by showing the Galatians how they were already Abraham's offspring through Christ. Because of this, there is no need for them to be circumcised. To unravel the teachings that the Galatians had endured, Paul unders underscored the fact that Abraham, the father of the faithful, was justified. Uh, he was counted faithful uh, by his faith in God. Paul began to develop the theme of blessings of faith versus a curse and yoke of the law. He strengthened that position by unfolding how Jesus freed us from the law. So as we get into this uh, lesson background, we want to talk a little bit about why uh, this epistle was so critical um, in A.D. 57. Uh, some scholars date it as early as A.D. 48 or as late as uh, A.D. 58. Uh, but despite uncertainty regarding when the letter was written, the general contours of why are quite clear. Uh, some individuals in the churches were teaching that the Christians of Gentile heritage needed to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. Such converts could not belong to God's people until they did so. The reasoning for such position was that Israel had always been distinct uh, uh, as the people of God. It was to Israel that God had revealed himself, given his law and specified circumcision as the sign of his covenant, 
and you can see some reference back over in Genesis uh, chapter 17 uh, verses 7 through 14 so if God were making himself known through the gospel to the nations then people from the nations uh, who come to God in Christ should be circumcised uh, and so to this reasoning Paul had already answered no uh, in text in the text preceding that of today's lesson you can see some reference back over in Galatians chapter 2 verses 3 verse 11 and verse 12 so uh, uh, all of these things as we look at the book of, of Galatians um, it sets forth uh, the theme of maintain, maintaining our freedom uh, in Christ. Uh, also, with this this epistle, uh, it necessitated. It was necessitated by serious defection among Paul's converts in the Roman province of Galatia. Uh, some of these converts were made. Uh, on his first, second, and third missionary journeys. I want to give you some scripture for these so you can have some uh, base of your study. Acts chapter 13, uh, verses 4 through uh, verse 4, and then Acts chapter 14, I believe verse 28, um, Acts chapter 16, verse 6, and then Acts chapter 18 and verse 23. Uh, also, uh, I want to give you Acts chapter 15 beginning at verse 1 and if you go back over there you can see the conflict uh, over circumcision and that's where we are today in this in this study all of this uh, doctrine if you will uh, took its foundation from the Mosaic law and if you know anything about the book of Galatians Paul was very upset uh, with these new converts uh, after which he had preached the gospel of grace um, and, and they had defected uh, uh, from the faith from the gospel according to grace faith in Jesus Christ um, back to the rudiments of the law uh, trying to justify themselves by good works and we see a lot of that in the church today and we have to be careful about teachings, uh, doctrine today that uh, emphasize that uh, we don't use so much circumcision in our culture, but we do set other benchmarks for people to reach in order for them to 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 fit in, if you will, or to be saved. I've heard a lot of disturbing things over the years that people are trying to do because somebody told them that that's what the Bible says that they needed to do and so it's very important that we study uh, the Bible and study how we got to be uh, saved and we're going to give you some scriptures a little later on to support our points but uh, Paul had his work cut out for him uh, with these converts all of this disruption if you will and confusion and defection is going on in the church keep that in mind so let's begin our first outline is entitled reconciliation taken from Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29 and I want to read this from the uh, NIV translation the Bible says so in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed uh, uh, and heirs according to the promise. You really need to go back and read the beginning of chapter 3 of the book of Galatians. Uh, but I like this wording here. Paul is trying to get across, uh, reiterate to the church people, to these converts that that uh, so in Christ, so in Christ Jesus, in Him, you are all children of God. And I like this through faith. I want you to read when you have a little time, uh, Romans chapter five, verse one and and two through faith this is how we got into 
uh, became members, if you will, of the church. Uh, verse 27, for all of you who were baptized. And what happened to us when we believe uh, on the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, we won't have time today, but Ephesians chapter 1 will give you some perspective that after believing, after hearing the gospel and believing it, then we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Holy Spirit. And so what the Holy Spirit does, he baptizes us into the very presence of God or into the church, if you will. And, and that means we have clothed ourselves uh, with Christ. And so in this realm, uh, in this sphere uh, 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 of activity, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter about being a Jew nor a Gentile. Uh, and, and I want us to understand this because uh, the book of Ephesians, again, it sets the tone that we, uh, as Paul says in the sixth chapter, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is all about spirit. And we have to keep in mind John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, helps us to understand that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Not in not being a Jew or a Gentile or somebody that's a slave or free and, and, and or even male or female. All of this is irrelevant in the spirit. And that's the issue that we have to make sure that uh, since the Bible has made no distinction, then we don't make a distinction. That's very important. And then Paul goes on to say here in verse 28, we are all one. We all share the same oneness because we all came into the church the same way. We all had to believe. We all had to adhere to. We all had to accept Jesus Christ. And this is what makes us one. Uh, Jesus says in the 14th chapter of John, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So we all share in this oneness because we all have to come the same way. And this is the only way we can get into the church, if you will. We, are, uh, we can't shake a preacher's hand. We are born into the church. We are not. Uh, we are members, if you will, of the local physical church. And that's where we attend. But how we became parts of the mystical body of Christ and of the church is through faith. And so uh, Paul is making this case here, as he says in verse 29, if if you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And so we know that Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So we believe God. Uh, we believe that God sent his only begotten son. We believe that message. And so that qualifies us or justifies us by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, that this testimony that God gave concerning his son, we accepted it. And that's what makes us heirs according to this promise. But here it goes on to say some were trying to say that the Galatian church was not unified because members of the church had not been circumcised as the Jewish Christians had been under Judaism. However, Paul reminded all that we all belong to God and are counted as children of God by faith. Uh, Hebrews, I, I'm going to give you some scripture a little later on to qualify this, but Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is a very excellent book to study uh, when you're looking at the law uh, and, and, and what you will find in the book of Hebrews, uh, that theme over there is a Christ superior to all. Christ superior to all. And then you begin to run into the word better, better covenant, better promises. And so we don't have to uh, worry about uh, uh, doing something to qualify ourselves before God, even in the 11th chapter of Hebrews the writer says he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder uh, uh, to them that diligently seek him and so this is what happens to us when we accept uh, Jesus Christ by faith so believers are no longer servants but sons uh, who are allowed freer access to God because of our relationship with Jesus 
Verse 27 teaches us that it is through the baptism into the body of Christ that we all wear the same garments. We are all dressed in the righteousness of Christ. What does that word mean, righteousness? So, so that word means that we have been put into right standing uh, before God uh, by faith. Also, I want you to read uh, Psalm 32. Uh, and so we want to be able to understand these principles. And these are things that we have to defend. Uh, if you're already saved, uh, there's nothing you can do to help God. Uh, uh, God saved you because God is God. Uh, and we have to move past trying to help God and trying to help ourselves uh, before God as though we can do something to earn a position uh, of grace. It's unmerited favor. There's absolutely nothing we can do uh, uh, outside of believing uh, that will uh, 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 sort of get you where you need to be in Christ. There's absolutely no amount of money. There's no status, no position. And Paul is itemizing it here. The Jews can't say that they're exclusive to it. The Gentiles can't. The slave, the free man, even male or female. How often do we struggle between gender in the church? Where is it in the Bible where we, can, we have to be saved according to all of these different uh, rules and regulations outside of what God has given? And this type of thing was going on in the church. Uh, at Galatia at this time and Paul is helping these church members understand that that you're going wrong they had defected can you imagine they had defected from the grace that God had given them to be saved and then they took it upon themselves to say you know God uh, what you did wasn't good enough and I'm just just giving you some examples of of, of how uh, deadly this can be that we leave what God has done for us and then we say to God uh, 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 as an example that I can save myself. Or I can do good and, and, and do these things and sort of earn my way. And that's just not the case. But these uh, Judaizing teachers, teachers of Jesus uh, who combined Jewish law wanted everyone to believe that they must be circumcised and thus keep the law of Moses in order to be uh, truly considered saved. And so in Paul in verse 29 firmly stated that if you belong to Christ, then you are already a seed of Abraham and an heir to the promise, thus entitled to great blessings and privileges that are due a child of God. So one of the things that we have to understand about the law, there's not absolutely nothing wrong with the law Jesus says in the fifth chapter of Matthew that he didn't come to destroy the law but he came to fulfill so he came to demonstrate uh, the fulfillment of the law and so what the law did for us according to the book of Galatians it taught us about sin it taught us that sin was sin and so and so that the law trained us that, that we were doing things that we shouldn't be doing. And so now we couldn't keep ourselves. So when we broke one law, we broke the whole law of God. So what Christ did, he showed us how uh, uh, not only to keep the law, but to be victorious through him. So we have to keep in mind, this is the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, staying with us, as Jesus says in John chapter 14, that he would leave us as orphans. And so without the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot live this Christian life. So, but if there's no act. There's, uh, the law still acts as a guide, uh, creating a sense of sin and need by pricking and preparing one's heart to repent, to, uh, to turn and receive Jesus into his or her life. Uh, if, and it is this new relationship with Jesus, one of reconciliation whereby Christ brings us back to God that swallows up all pride and prejudices in our lives. That's beautiful to understand. But the question is asked here in the quarterly, have you ever experienced racial, economic, or social biases? Have you ever experienced these in the church? 
share ways that you can overcome them, especially those within our own church walls. We have to study. This is what Paul tells Timothy. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God that need not be ashamed rightly. What's that word mean? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Literally cutting a straight line with the gospel. And this is what happens when uh, uh, people start teaching things that they don't understand and it causes a disruption. And I don't know about you, but I can tell you uh, as a new convert years ago, uh, uh, there are many things that, that disturb my faith. And I don't know if you've ever had that to happen. There are things that people teach and it shakes our faith. And what do we do about those things? All of us have experienced biases in the church. All kinds of things that have come between us uh, because one believes something and another believes something else. But, but if we would study the Word of God and come together in prayer, that, that, that doesn't mean we won't ever have any doctrinal discussion and questions may come up. But what did Jesus say? What does the Bible say? Uh, this is the antidote for all doctrinal errors. Keep that in mind. Our second outline is entitled Rectification. This is taken from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Again, from the NIV translation. This is a beautiful discussion that the Apostle Paul is having with his church. And all of the depth and the, 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 the strategy that he's using doctrinally to get these converts back on track. Uh, but verse 1 of the fourth chapter of Galatians says, What I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the, old, the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. Verse 3, So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. What is Paul saying here? So, uh, although we are reconciled to God through Christ, there is still a need for rectification. Paul used uh, the well-understood legalistic system of inheritance to drive his point home and dissuade the Galatians from seeking and being circumcised. For while the child is an heir to all uh, of his father's belongings, it is well known that the child is not mature enough to handle the freedom and responsibilities that come with this inheritance. Therefore, as verses 1 and 2 of Galatians uh, 4 point out, as children we toil and grow with the servants and can appear to be likened unto them since they are both under the control and influence of others. However, the children have guidance, guardians, and, and, uh, and trustees to help them along the way until they are mature enough to handle their own affairs. And let, let me just say this to you about a new convert. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's a very, uh, I don't want to say dangerous, but it's a very uh, 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 difficult position for someone who is transitioning out of the world into the church. Let's, let's just talk about that for a minute. And, and so they are depending on, just like an heir or, 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 or a newborn, they are depending on everything that someone tells them. They are not strong enough to handle the full doctrine of Jesus Christ. They are, sti they are still on milk. They can't handle uh, uh, so, many, uh, so much depth of truth. So we have to work with new converts and understand that there is a nurturing process uh, that they are going through until they get to a mature age or a mature spiritual uh, uh, position where they can say, okay, I understand what you're saying. But a new convert uh, understands very little about the basics of, 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 of the position that they're in. This is something that we learn 
over the course of time. This is what our new members orientation seeks to achieve. This is what Sunday school seeks to achieve. This is what Bible class seeks to, uh, uh, to achieve. And so we have to uh, appreciate, I'm not knocking the Galatians, these young converts, but they are just in a pivotal period in their lives of, of trusting or entrusting themselves to people who are much stronger in the law or in doctrinal affairs and manipulating them to go one way or the other. So this is what happened to these converts and they had turned and, and Paul asked the question, who has bewitched you? What happened to you? Who did this to you? Who uh, uh, taught you this? I came in and preached the gospel of grace, and, and, and the minute I go away, somebody comes in and start teaching you something else, and you're not strong enough. So I, I tell people all the time, it's a very dangerous thing to church hop. To be going sampling all of these different places, especially when you're not doctrinally sound to handle uh, these truths. So let us keep these things in mind and let us appreciate where these Galatians are, that they are in trouble. And thank God for the Apostle Paul. Uh, uh, it, it, you can imagine what it's like for somebody uh, who, who gets saved and then somebody starts putting yokes on them. Uh, that they wasn't, they were not able to bear. And so this is uh, the dilemma sometimes that we see in our churches. So the bondage here refers to a great number of burdensome rites and observances. Uh, and so this is what happens uh, uh, if you don't do this, if you don't uh, uh, come over here, if you're not over here at this time, you don't give this and give that. And we put all of these restrictions and, uh, uh, on people and, and, and that they don't know any better and they're trying to accommodate uh, the things that we're teaching, but it is a yoke. So uh, there's another question asked in the quarterly here, uh, are there any rituals or routines in your church that have become a yoke for people to fully experience and enjoy the fullness of their salvation and relationship with Christ. Absolutely, there are many rituals, but here's the thing, and I've always said this over the years, when we have an objective in the church, uh, we have an agenda, if you will, the best protocol I believe is to be biblically based. If you're going to have a theme for something, uh, you're going to uh, 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 put some program together. You ought to have some biblical perspective about that uh, uh, and be able to be in, in good biblical context about that approach so you don't uh, subject people to something that is your ritual, uh, your routine that has nothing to do with the Bible, but then when people don't comply, then you make a distinction that somehow they are not a part of the body of Christ. So we have to be careful with that because these are very, very tricky things that uh, that we see every day. And so our last outline is entitled Rationalization. This is taken from Galatians uh, chapter 4 verses 4 through 7 again from the NIV translation but when the set time had fully come God sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his son God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts the spirit who calls out Abba Father Verse 7, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. I want you to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12, and Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse, verses 11 through 18. And just to sort of talk a little bit about this law, and, and, and what happened with the Pharisees in Jesus' day, uh, these individuals not only uh, uh, taught the adherence, strict adherence to the law, but they also added to the law. They added things that, that were not in the law, but they believed that they should be included. And then they uh, 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 had a mandate where 
individuals follow. They even accused Jesus of doing things on on the Sabbath, and they were following. They were following him around and his disciples around to catch them uh, in some violation of the law. And we just have to be careful. The the law is good. There's nothing wrong with the law. Uh, I believe Psalm 32 will help us understand. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the law. Also Psalm 19. The law is good. But we have to use the law. uh, The way that the Bible teaches us uh, to use it. Because if if the truth be told. uh, None of us uh, should be here. If it was by uh, something that we have done to earn our way we should all be gone but God being rich in his mercy and grace he has forgiven us of all of our transgressions all of our law breaking and all of our uh, 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 disobedient attitudes toward him he has saved us Uh, but while I'm on this point the spirit of the Lord just Wants, re- wants me to remind you, don't condemn yourself. Romans 8 chapter 1 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation. You would be surprised how many times we condemn ourselves when the Bible has liberated us. God has set you free. So if we have committed sin, then the process of that is uh, uh, taken out of the first epistle of John Uh, uh, chapter 1 all of that is good to read uh, that we confess and we repent of our sins and then it tells us that God is faithful God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins so we don't have to condemn ourselves just ask God for forgiveness and he will cleanse you John says from all of our unrighteousness everything that's not befitting of an individual believer being in right standing with God. That that God has not cleansed will be cleansed. This is a progression. Philippians chapter 1 uh, verse 6. He that began a good work in you. Will perform or perfect it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So just understand. Hebrews chapter 12 helps us understand. That, that, that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith he initiated you to believe on him and then he is able uh, to bring our faith to its maturity to its to its uh, uh, a state where it can stand up and that's what needed to happen uh, with with these Galatians with these new converts they was they were put into a position of grace sanctification justification uh, through Jesus Christ. They just needed to stand on it. So we want to keep that in mind. But it goes on to uh, tell us here that uh, Paul did not leave his readers pondering the yoke of the law, but elaborated on the fullness of God's plan by giving them the rationale behind the process. So in verse 4, Paul pointed out that in due time, the time appointed by the Father, He would put an end to the legalistic structure and set up one that is better. That's in the book of uh, Hebrews. Now that Christ has appeared, Jews and Gentiles have gained their legal majority and maturity, a legal and rightful standing and claim to our inheritance. The claim could not be made until God sent his son to set things in order under the requirements. I want you to read Philippians chapter 2. I'm giving you a lot of scriptures because I want to qualify uh, my argument, if you will, in our discussion so we can have some reference point uh, uh, in in Christianity. And if you haven't understood this yet, there will be times you will have to defend your position, uh, but you don't have to do it uh, outside of the Bible. Do it with the Bible. Paul had to do it. Jesus had to do it. We have to do it. We have to stand our ground on what we believe uh, because these uh, not just Judaizers but these false teachers are still roaming around and they are heavily entrenched in the church and so we have to arm ourselves make sure you have a Bible when you go to church take notes Uh, if you can record record go back and investigate 
what individuals are telling you don't just leave it to somebody to tell you what you need to know and then you don't study for yourself don't ever be in a church or a, a, a institution of learning without something in your hand to follow along with these scriptures and with these doctrines and with these things and when you see that is something outside of the scope then you know where you are and this is what Paul is doing with the church at Galatia. He's arming them with information so they can protect themselves. They needed to protect themselves because they couldn't have it the way that they wanted to live it. We cannot have grace plus the law. It's either going to be one or the other. Either God is going to save you or you're going to try to help him save you. Which one would you rather have? Keep that in mind. But the question is asked uh, in the quarterly can you think of and share your personal process of growth in Christ identifying those things that you had to go through to fully understand grace and mercy absolutely and we're still learning more and more about God's grace and his mercy and one of the things that we're learning that uh, uh, about God if he's already done something there's no need to pray about it he's fixed it if he's saved you he saved you so we just need to understand and appreciate what God has already done what he has already done those are the things that we need to take hold of because that will adjust our prayers if you will uh, uh, certainly we can continue to pray about everything but just just think about that what has God already done that we can see scripturally these individuals in at the church of Galatia they were already saved but they were going backward and had not appreciated the position that God had already put them in through Jesus Christ that is powerful to understand and they were missing the mark and not enjoying uh, uh, one of the things I love about the book of Philippians what's the theme of that book is the joy of knowing Christ and when we're wandering around trying to find our way we're missing out on the joy apostle john wrote these things uh in the first epistle of john chapter one he said these things right that 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 we write we write that your joy may be full is your joy full today do you have are you full of joy are you full of that because you understand what god has already done and these are the spiritual uh, components if you will they had no peace the church of Galatia they had no peace because they they left the grace they should have been at peace with what God had already done for them but they 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 mishandled the peace that God gave them and they went back to try to find some peace in the law and there was none one of the things that I love and we'll move on very quickly that I learned uh, studying the book of Hebrews one of the things that we have to do as believers, we have to rest. We have to rest as God did after his six days of activity in creation. The Bible says on the seventh day he rested. And we have to rest from our labors of trying to work out salvation. Uh, the book of Hebrews will teach us that I believe uh, uh, in the uh, third and the fourth chapters. I want you to read those. But we ought to be at rest why because we have obtained and we understand that this is a finished work you are in a process that God initiated in your life you can stand down it's already at work don't you see God changing you and and maturing you don't you see the work he's doing in your life that's going to continue so it causes us to rest God is at the helm he's in control uh, he's taken over uh, 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 the responsibility of saving you and bringing you uh, 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 where you should be and bringing me where I should be. You're not going to miss this. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said these words, I believe, in the 16th chapter of John. Those that are in my hand, no man shall pluck them out. If you are in the hand of God today through Jesus Christ, there's nobody that can pluck you out. So be at rest and be at peace that God is running this. God is in control. Uh, God is handling you if he will. If you will. So this is a beautiful lesson. But there are some warnings here for all of us today. And this is what Paul 
is trying to get across here that there are some people teaching some things uh, that are hurting you. It's not helping you. The gift of God's Holy Spirit dwells in the believer, ensuring our connection to God. The Holy Spirit prompts and guides us to learn more about and uh, more about and love more deeply our God. This acceptance of the Holy Spirit into our hearts is the guarantee of our relationship with God. I know you feel with the Holy Spirit, but did you know that's a guarantee that you are a child of God? Don't you know that is a guarantee that you are one of those who God said he predestined, he wanted you to be with him for all eternity. And so the Holy Spirit is in your life to tell you that, to remind you of that, to groom you for where you are going. Didn't Jesus say that to his disciples in the 14th chapter of John? He said, I go away to prepare a place. I will come again and receive you unto myself. So if God has intended for you to be where he is, you're not going to miss that. And the Holy Spirit is there. Uh, Jesus said it to his disciples. This Holy Spirit is. He lives with you, in you. He's not going anywhere. He's not a part-time person. He is intended. God sent him into our hearts, as Jesus says in the 14th chapter of John, to remain. He's going to stay there. He's going to finish the work of preparing you for where you and I need to go. This is beautiful. So here, can you think uh, of... And share your personal process and growth in Christ. So all of us are learning grace and mercy. A good example might be that someone you never expected to give you forgiveness did so. As I prepare to close, I have been for the last days, few days, I can share this with you. Just thanking God for what I know what I know he's done in my life and I just say to God you've been so good to me in spite of all of the trials and the tribulations God you've been good to me I can look back over my life I know you may forgive me and and others may forgive me but he forgave me of all of my sins that is priceless everything sinful that I could have done, that I even imagined and tried to implement, God says, I forgive you of that. Isn't that beautiful? And when we do things that we shouldn't do, and we say things that we shouldn't say, even as believers, God says to you, I forgive you. Just confess to me. Come to me. I'll forgive you of that. No problem. And I'll cleanse you so you, you won't have to do that anymore. Isn't that beautiful? That's the part of this relationship that we miss. And sometimes we carry around in ourselves unconfessed sin. Which is a big problem in the church. Unconfessed sin. We don't tell nobody. We don't, we don't pray about it. We just let it go. But God says, I would have forgiven you of that. I will forgive you of that. I can cleanse you of that. That's not a problem. I've seen all of that. So we need to tap into these truths today. And there's some spiritual blessings that the church of Galatia was missing out on. And I don't want us to miss out on these things. So accept Jesus Christ. Know that he loves you. He's in love with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to walk away. He's going to keep working. God works in our lives he intercedes he comes to our aid he neither slumbers he doesn't sleep his eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good so I hope that this lesson encourages you as it has encouraged me I want to read this closing prayer Lord teach us to submit to your will you are not a God of confusion but of love peace and unity make us better bolder and brighter so that we might be better servants unified by love and word and deed in the name of Jesus we pray amen 
So again, until such time that the law will permit us to come together again, we say God bless you.